I've actually never applied for a job in my life. Really? No, I've only been to a few gyms and then they've asked me to work there or said, do you want a job there? So I've never had to apply for a job. It's quite strange, isn't it? It's amazing. Well, it is, but what if everything goes wrong and then I need to apply for a job and I've never done it before? No, I don't think it will. I think that, um, I think that what you're doing at the moment will become your life's work. Yeah. I'm lucky because I knew I've always known what I wanted to do as well. And some people aren't in that position because it's difficult. If you leave school and you're like, what do I do now? Where do you start if you don't know what you love doing? And so I was lucky for that in that way that I knew. Did you, um, I guess, like having done all the powerlifting and stuff, did you know that you were going to be a PT as a result of doing that? Um, yeah, I was learning to be a PT before I did the Commonwealth. So yeah, I I was doing musical theatre when I left school, and during that course, I realised I I started the gym when I was sixteen, perhaps I think, when I was on that course, and then realised that that's what I wanted to be doing because I just thought about that all day instead. So mm. I then realised that was what I needed to be doing instead. Yeah, it's intoxicating. Once you fall in love with someone, and you start doing it really well, mm. it becomes everything. Like it's your for me, I think with like the training and stuff, the yoga, and, which are all like recent additions to like my platform. Once I discovered them, that's all I wanted to live and eat. Yeah. Because I knew how they served me and how they could serve other people. Yeah. Thank you for joining us. I would like to introduce you to Emily Killick. Um, she's 24 years old. She has her own business as. A PT coach, and she's also a powerlifting uh, champion. So, um, yeah, I'm gonna hand you over to Emily, and she's gonna tell you a little bit about her business. And we've got a plethora of uh, topics that we're gonna get into. So, Emily, tell me a little bit about your business. So, I luckily, as I was saying to you earlier, I knew what I wanted to do as soon as I left school. So. I've been a PT for coming up to eight years. Um, I actually prefer doing one-to-ones. I like seeing people face-to-face. So there's a lot of PT work at a gym at my house. Um, I do online coaching as well. And interestingly, uh, where we met at the Fitness Summit, um, they were talking about how it's obviously more scalable having online coaching business. So yeah. I'm at the moment, I'm working with doing some more online clients while still sort of keeping the PT that I enjoy doing so it's a balance of that what's more scalable but also what I love doing and why I started doing is because I like being around people so it's balancing those two um yeah so I've been doing it for eight years I've got a nice setup of clients sort of maybe seven eight each day which is lovely and perfect it means I can train in my own sort of gaps as well between clients which is ideal for my life obviously I don't ever want that to be taken away my own time where I'm training and then doing my clients around that so yeah I love my work and working with people so that's the main incentive for me and helping people obviously so Amazing. I think I got into the coaching side of this for the exact same reasons mm-hmm. that they're working with people and being able to see change in people's lives um, having worked in the corporate world where it's, everything is focused on results and turning around the bottom line making sure that margins are met and the board are getting their big cuts uh, and walking away happy and the employees are suffering because they're working themselves into the ground for the, the benefit of others and then having taken that as a segue and looked at those individuals that are suffering in that environment and how i could help them yeah. um, and i think i a lot of my target audience in that regard was people that I'd worked with, taking them and I guess coaching them yeah. for that exact same reason you mentioned a second ago. Seeing people develop and, and change and achieve their goals is, yeah. is a beautiful thing. Yeah. And when you've done it yourself as well, I think that's motivating because you know how much it changes your own mental well-being. It's not just a physical thing either and how you look necessarily. Yes, that's some people's goal and you can train them to get there. But I think you sometimes need almost like a deeper purpose as well because that changes how you look. You can change that. And we know that some people obviously struggle and that's why we're in a job. But we know you can change that in a certain amount of time. But I think if you have a deeper level of why you want to change that and something interesting as well, going back to the fitness summit again that James Smith said was that 
yes, okay, you, maybe you want to lose fat, but why do you want to lose fat? Like, yeah. And that gives you more motivation, I think, rather than just, I'll lose a bit of body fat. Like, okay, but why? Is it because you, you're you unhappy going to work every day? It's because you're going to be the biggest bridesmaid, for example. Like, the, I think a deeper purpose for what your goal is and your why is, is really important for sticking at it. It means something more to you. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. It's, uh, it's all about longevity, right? Yeah. So, out of... I have core principles that I follow with anybody that I'm taking on as, a, as an initial client. Like the first interview that I will do, all of my clients are taken through an interview process. Yeah. And I will sometimes not work with people if I don't believe that they'll be ready to want yeah. to achieve the goals. Because one, it's a waste of my time. And yeah. I don't want to see somebody continue failing because they aren't able to commit to the plan. Um, but the thing is, why do you want to do it? Like, what is the purpose? Are you willing to make the commitments and the sacrifices required to achieve those goals? And then looking at it from an, an education point of view as well. So like all of my clients that I work with, I'll say to them, I want you to be with me for six months. Yeah. And the reason it is a six month commitment is by the end of the six months, I want you to tell me, Neil, I no longer need your services. Yeah. Thank you. You've taught me how to have a good relationship with food, how to be consistent in the gym. To understand that if I want to live a certain way, I've got to consume a diet that takes into consideration what my goal is. If I want to lose weight, burn more than I consume. Yeah. If I want to build muscle, consume more than I burn. Yeah. Um, principally, also understand like your carb profiles, your protein profiles, the fat pro- profiles, different types of diets. If you have any underlying health issues to be put in touch with a nutritionist mm-hmm. um, that can assist with helping you achieve your goals. A lot of the things that I also look at is like if somebody comes to me with a certain set of issues, um, I will say to them, Look, I'm not the right person for you, I'll coach you, but from a nutritional perspective, yeah. you need someone else for this. Let, let me get you in touch with this person. Yeah. And still have that sort of community. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's just such a beautiful thing to see people grow. Yes, there's, there's principles that need to be met. Yeah, and that's giving people the tools, right? Rather than saying, we're going to do this for four weeks, like you're set up of having a six months minimum period that they're coaching you for. It's, that's because you want them to learn the tools for life, not because you want to do, okay, we'll lose weight over this month. And then you'll go away and you'll just put it back on and, and you won't have anything you've actually taken from this that you can use for the rest of your life. Whereas that's where you're giving so much value and I like to think I am because people are taking something that they can use for the rest of their life, not just to lose a bit of weight and then put it back on again. So, Or whatever their goal is, that's an example, but it's yeah. not a quick fix. It's something they can use for life. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, what's your legacy? What are you, yeah. what are you leaving behind? What do you want? How do you want to touch people's lives? <laughs> And how are they going to share that message with other people? Yeah. What can you be doing that adds value to the world? I'm not, like, you're, not, you're not ever going to completely touch the entire world, maybe the way that the Dalai Lama has. Who you knows? I mean, maybe you, maybe you will. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I'm not trying to be restricted in that respect. There, so I know. I wasn't, I wasn't <laughs> I know trying not. to be disrespectful. No, it's true. But you can change one person's world, potentially. Yeah, exactly. Just because you don't change everyone's, you can change someone's. Yeah. Um, and I think we live in in a world at the moment where there is very little that you can do without being offensive to someone. This is so, that's so interesting you said that because this morning, I don't know if you saw my Instagram, I had a story about a man who, um, just an older man that was in the gym who came up to me and said, do you mind if I'm doing uh, my chest presses in the mirror facing the same way you're doing your hip thrusts in the mirror next to me? Um, and it's because he's so nervous, which is sad, really, if you think about it. That was kind of him and thoughtful that he was worried, concerned that I would mind that. But that's because of a small percentage of people that are not just innocently and genuinely sort of looking around and are maybe creepy that girl, young girls find, um, or men. But it's, yeah, he felt that he couldn't even be there because it could, he would be doing something wrong or I might accuse him of looking at me. Or So it's interesting to say that because it's, it's sad that, people feel they can't even do things right now social media has changed the world yeah you know i think if i think back to the world that i grew up in where you went to a gym there weren't people weren't constantly on their phones you went you could have a full-on session and yeah. if you went and, and looked at a girl because she was beautiful you looked at her because she was beautiful yeah because of social media and because of all these memes that go around if you're not looking at a girl 
you become immune for being a creep. Yeah, it's sad. Or, or, yeah. or other things. And so I think the psychology of social media has changed the way we feel comfortable in certain ways. Yeah. yeah, and you can't necessarily be yourself because you're worried you're going to offend somebody, whatever you might say. It's difficult to to be in that position where you're just innocently doing things and feel that you're, you could just offend someone all the time. Yeah, yeah it's uh, interesting as well. <laughs> um, so tell me a little more about your powerlifting escapades. I know that you've, um, you've got a 27, 2017 England squat record. Yeah. Um, and you've got the triple gold um, for the Commonwealth. Yeah. Um, several other first places in local competitions and stuff. But, uh, in your own words, tell me more about your... Uh, yeah, so actually I never... I didn't initially set out to achieve any records. That was never my goal. It, it sort of came as a byproduct of what I was doing and what I loved doing. I joined the gym initially to lose weight. I didn't know what I was doing, so I kind of just plodded on the treadmill for like an hour every day, like kick, like you kind of do when you're like, you don't know what you're actually doing. So that's how I started. And then I met uh, a few people in that gym who were powerlifting and said, kind of, give this a go and try and see how you get on. And so I did and fell in love with doing that and becoming stronger, which is still my goal now and it always has been. My, my goals aren't aesthetic. I go through phases where I, I might cut down and, and things like that and maybe want to change my physique a bit. But ultimately, my main goal is my strength. Um, and so I fell in love with that process rather than ever thinking, I want to achieve this goal or I want to set this record. And then that just kind of came with it. I went to more local competitions like Southeast ones um, and then qualified for the next one for All England, qualified for um, the Commonwealth in 2017, uh, which, yeah, I wasn't even sure if I was going to go to when I, when I got the letter because um, I'd never travelled to South Africa or somewhere very far at that point. I was only young, so it was a nerve-wracking thing to go and do and to be the pressure of the competition in a new place that I'd never been to. Um, but yeah, of course, I'm so glad I did go and had the courage to go. And I was practically forced to go by like my friends and my family because they knew it was such a huge thing for me to do and I'll be happy when I am there. So yeah, Commonwealth 2017, got triple gold, which I was, I, I never felt the way I felt at that moment in my life with anything. And also what pushed me more than anything was one particular man actually that worked in the gym I worked at when I was 17 and he said you'll you'll never be able to do that and that is one thing that made me do it that's that is literally the reason I managed it and why I forced myself to do it because I I, yeah yeah and I think you can take that either way you can either let that completely knock you and think oh my god yeah I can't do that and it could be so easy to do that and understandably you would find it some people would find that challenging but luckily for me I took that as that's I'm going to do it now literally because you've said I can't so I yeah there's so many people that would have taken that differently yeah and like, gone into themselves and mm-hmm. gone maybe lost the love or lost the yeah. confidence and just sad yeah go back to the gym and stuff and um I love that you used that as like that was fuel. my fuel yeah it was that one comment and I remember it so clearly like where I was standing the way he said it all of it I remember everything about it because it was that probably changed my life in a way because I then I'm, I'm a PT because of that really and essentially all of these things sort of come together and that's why my life is the way it is now and I think there's a lot of things like that that happen that maybe at the time can be a negative thing yeah but then you look back later on and you think that that did happen for a reason, actually. I believe in that. So I can see I that. Think, yeah. I can see that that's a massive motivator. Yeah. And like a, a big sort of stepping stone toward the things that you have now acquired. Yeah. I've, I've had similar things happen in my life. I had teachers that told me I'd never amount to anything. Me too, yeah. Um, because of my ADHD. Um, I had people that were very close to me that didn't cheer you for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I won't go into that, but we can talk about that on um, part two of the ADHD yeah. um, section of this. Excited for that. Yeah, me too. Uh, that's going to be interesting. And I've, I think for that, I've purposely not prepared anything because I, wanted, I want people to get an interpretation and an understanding of what an ADHD brain looks like. Yeah. Um, so that's going to be an interesting one. 
that's off part two. Yeah, um, like so the teachers and stuff that like had all these opinions and people that were close to me that said because of my ADHD I never really completed anything and mm-hmm. I'd start things and not finish them, which is ADHD through and through to a certain degree. I think when I left home when I was 18 and came to the UK, um, I it was make or break. You know, I had to fight on my feet. Be a man, you know, get get a job. I, I was well, I got a job through my brother, I was working as his apprentice. But I had to perform. Yeah. You know, it was a it was a job, it wasn't school anymore, it wasn't going around the corner and having a good time with the mates. Um I had to pay rent and you know, all these things all that, these real life things. It was straight <laughs> away. And um I think as a byproduct of, of all of that happening so quickly for me. Having not gone to uni, having not finished school, um, I had those memories come back. And once I'd started making really good money, and the business was doing very well, and I was very good at my job, you know, winning all the contracts and things, um, I just had like this feeling of, you know, fuck all of you. Try to bracket me and tell me that I can't do things and choose things. And not from a cocky perspective, like when I was younger, it was like, I could get my mom. Yeah, of course it is, yeah, because like you've been told you're not going to do yeah, that. Yeah. Really well, consistent with my work. Um, the people that I'm working for, I think the quality of my work, they can not. Yeah, well, there you go. And they're probably watching this podcast. <laughs> yeah, they, they probably will be. You know? and, and that's, that's <laughs> a very interesting thing you just said there. A lot of the people who aren't your cheerleaders that follow you will always follow what you do and they will always have nasty things to say. They watch you more than anyone. Jealousy. Yeah, yeah. they watch you more than anyone does. And stagnation because they've not done anything with their lives. Yeah. It's very easy to have an opinion about somebody or something. But have you actually done that for me? Yeah. What entitles you to your opinion? You're entitled to it, but yeah. I'm not going to accept it if you haven't no. exercised what I have. Mm-hmm. And if you would, you take advice from this person that's giving you criticism. And if you wouldn't, Absolutely then you not. don't. You don't need. It doesn't make any difference what mm-hmm. they say. If you wouldn't go to them for advice, then you don't need. Don't take their criticism. It's one show, of my favorite yeah, things. It's, it's show me your successes, mm-hmm. and I will accept your opinions. Yeah. Why would you otherwise? I I will only take opinions or accept opinions and take advice from people who I look up to that have exercised and demonstrated that they are leaders in their market. Yeah, yeah. Because that is that's growth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this particular man that I was talking about who said I wouldn't be able to do that um, that 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 motivated me was also a personal trainer, and it's like. And same again, and not I'm not cocky, I'm very humble about what I do, but again, look at what I've achieved since then. And he's working in the same job that I was when I was 16. And there's nothing wrong with that job at all, working on the gym floor. I've done that for years, nothing wrong with that. But the growth that I've experienced since that point is fascinating from someone that's still at the same point seven years ago that I was at. And now I've done so much more and they're in the same place. So that's the reason it's interesting psychology because he believes I maybe genuinely believes I couldn't achieve that but that's because he couldn't achieve that and he hasn't so possibly that's his genuine opinion that I wouldn't be able to achieve that it might not be coming from a place of hatred it's he does genuinely think that's not possible but that's because it's not possible for him and I'm not saying that in a cocky way but that should be motivating for people that have those comments or think they're not capable is that coming from someone else that's not capable or is it because they if, if you're not, or is it because they're not? Yeah. So absolutely interesting thing you said there was that I'm a very much a true believer in that you can achieve absolutely anything you set your mind to. Yeah. Look at what Elon Musk has done. Yeah. If you are willing to put in the hard work, put in the sacrifices, educate yourself, consume materials that add value to you as a person, you will go places in life. Yeah. If you Tell other people that what they're doing is wrong constantly and have opinions of other people and the way that they are living their lives. You have those feelings about yourself and you yeah. never grow. You'll never, never really amount to anything and you'll continue to be a nasty person to other people. Yeah. 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 So you've got nothing interesting going on for yourself. Yeah. 
So I've also had a little look, Ganda, look see at your social media. Um, and for anybody that hasn't, I will drop a hyperlink um, into the feed and go check out Emily's Insta. Um, I love the content you're putting out. Like it's very informative. It's great to engage with, easy to follow, loads of factual evidence-based information. Um, and I think there's a lot of people that will benefit from it. And I remember when I first started out with um, Fit Cody, um, during lockdown, hashtag 1.0. <laughs> <laughs> what a weird time in all our lives. Um, I, I remember the challenges and like the daunting prospects of seeing a lot of people making moves. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of the PTs and I, I, I decided to do that as a result of one being made redundant as a, it was a COVID redundancy and needing to and this, like secure finances and stuff. But knowing in that moment in time that setting up a PT business with all of the gyms being shut, that would be a really good thing. Um, as somebody that was brand new, just had done a PT course, like the first sort of phases of it, um, picked up like in a plethora of candidates to want to do like trial subscriptions and then do like 12 week challenges. Yeah. Um, at one point, I was doing 35 people. So I worked with several PTs and very much understood with my ADHD brain, very analytical, and problem-solving, sort of driven. Um, and so I copied and pasted and took from these individuals and those individuals and created my own thing. Um, and it worked very quickly. And um, yeah, it was, I just remember how daunting doing all of those things was, was all the social media myself, all the nutrition plans myself, all the training plans, late night, seven days a week, kind of like just getting through it. But I loved it. Yeah. And there wasn't a moment where I thought, this isn't for me, I'm not enjoying this. Like even the late nights, I was doing like late night rants about people who were posting stupid things, <laughs> in, like misinformation and like fat diets and stuff. And, I think uh, if you are... That's the other thing that kind of leads to If you're self-employed, though, you also don't switch off. You, you kind of can't as well, No, I think. Because, like you say, late evenings, that's your clients still kind of need you, don't they? And they need accountability. And you do get text messages at, I don't know, I think a lot of PTs would agree, you get text messages at 8 p.m., 9 p.m. And about a consumer chocolate cake. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I've just seen my body weight in chocolate. What do I do now? Like. Yeah, so it's it's very much a whole, it is your whole life. And I think that does helpful in that it filters out the people who want to help people enough, probably, as well. And I love that, it's the, the whole chocolate cake thing and the chocolates and the Harry Boys. And it's like, when somebody comes to me and says, and I've, this is something that I, from the get-go, I'm like, please be honest with me. Yeah. I'm not going to bite your head off. Like, I really, I need to understand 100% what you're consuming, how you're feeling, yeah. like, Talk to me because if you want results, I need to know what's going on. Yeah. And if you're going to be dishonest, I will know because yeah. you won't be getting those yeah. results. If you aren't training and you're if you're eating shit and you're getting on the scale and you're not seeing your weight go down, it's because you're consuming more than you burn. Yeah, that's it's that science. simple. Yeah, it really is. Um, and people come to me and it's like, oh, I've had a Mackey's and I'm like, it's fine. You've not fallen off a wagon. This yeah. is like, oh, I've fallen off the wagon. There is no wagon. <laughs> there is none of that nonsense, these constructs that people have created. You're living your life. Just understand that by consuming those things, it's going to take you a little longer to yeah. achieve your goal. And be kind to yourself. You know, maybe you've done that for dopamine. Yeah. Why why did you yeah. yeah, why why did you like I would then go into like why do you think you needed that? Mm -hmm. Is your diet too hard? Like, is there something that we need to change? And that's what you don't know if people aren't honest. You don't know if it's, you don't know the reason behind it, why they've done it. If there's something else that you can alter throughout their week, if it's, if it's because something needs changing, you don't know that until they are honest with what has happened. And, yeah. and I make that sound like something's happened as if it's terrible, which the whole point is that it's not. But you do need to understand that that's happened, and for the honesty side of it, like you say, to know what we can change and how to help them. Yeah, so. and the vast majority of PTs don't give a toss. No, it's yeah. broccoli, chicken, rice, yeah, and a teaspoon of 
vegetable oil or something. <laughs> oh, God, it's just so painful. There's, just, there's no longevity in any of those nutrition plans. And it's, they get these plans that they've downloaded offline for competition coaches. And it's stuff that they're using in the gym because they're trying to train for aesthetics as opposed to performance. This is my opinion. Yeah. And, and I see it in almost every gym I go to. And then you have these guys and some girls. Um, not, I would say not as many girls. I might be wrong about that, but that's just my observation. Yeah. Walking around with this like small dick, big dick energy. Like <laughs> I'm fucking, yeah. I'm huge. I'm pumping pads. <laughs> like you can tell they're on pads. And it's just this like fucking assholes. Like I'm polite to everybody in the gym. When I'm training, I don't want to be bothered. Yeah. But if I see that somebody is observing something that I'm doing, like calisthenics, or if I'm doing something that looks a bit crazy, and I can see that you know they they're interested, I'll go and say hello. Yeah. Um, I'm there to train, and I'm, I'm there to get a session in. And then you have these guys, like the PT, the other day, one of the cables, like the cable machines, the cable cam on them, went to the office very nicely, like said to the guy, "Hi, mate. You know, like." Cables come undone. Do you mind just coming and having your legs sorting it out, or just like to like put a sign up to say the machine's out of use? And this guy looked at me like I ruined his whole day. <laughs> like I was as if it's not his job. Like it, yeah, it was like oh fucking hell, great thanks. <laughs> like <laughs> what have you done? <laughs> thanks for inconveniencing me whilst I'm sitting here t- looking at my screen doing nothing. <laughs> um, and then and then he was like, so he came and he like sorted it out and. I said thank you because one of the cables had come undone and just needed to bolt everything back together. And he's just like... You've yeah. ruined his day. <laughs> it's like, well, well done. Awesome. <laughs> cool. You, you're, you're hot. Yeah. <laughs> well <done. laughs> so scary. Yeah. Oh, God. Yeah, the, the whole gym environment is... Uh, we laugh, but it also can be a scary place for people. Yeah, it's intimidating. Right? Yeah. I'd, I'd say... 60% of my clients are intimidated. Yeah. Too. And mine too, if not more. And that's why I have a studio at my house where people train with me. And I think a majority of those people are here because they they get that, um, they get their session in. But And obviously they've got the whole PT side, so it's maybe more of an intense session. But also they're not having to be in a gym environment. And I think that's an incentive for a lot of people that come to me with my own gym because they don't have to be in a gym. And ultimately the goal is that they feel more comfortable and confident with what we're doing. And I taught them and given them the tools that we touched on earlier to go into a gym and feel more confident. But yeah, the sad thing, probably a lot of them are with me to start with because they don't feel confident in a gym. And part of that can be because of the way other people treat them. My experience is exactly the same. Mm-hmm. Who would you consider to be your biggest inspiration? Now we... Talk, we've talked about this before together, um, but and I mentioned my mum, which very much is still is still very true to me. But thinking about it as well is, and what we spoke about earlier about sort of naysayers, that's they probably are my inspiration. Actually, now I think about it more, the people that have said um, you can't do something that probably inspires me more than anyone saying, "Oh, you're brilliant, you can do this." You, I'm so proud of you. The people that say you can't are actually more inspiring to me and I tend to thrive off that and do a lot better when I've got even a negative comment the other day I got on Instagram which happens a lot and luckily it doesn't bother me but it would some people so it should never be said but I actually thrive from that and I find that inspiring because then I want to prove that I can do this thing that someone said I can't so touched on my mum and very much so my mum is an inspiration to me as well because she's just herself she's she's got nobody around her apart from me but she is just doing her own thing and you said that about yourself as well you've had to pick yourself up from hard times that you've had and that's my mum as well so that's inspiring in sort of my personal life but in training wise definitely people that have been haters are my inspiration yeah I love that I really do When it comes to inspiration, I think having been away from home from the age of 18 and having to become an adult all of my life, I had my father as a big inspiration for me, he still is. Um, 
and I guess my mom is also an inspiration. You know, they've done wonderful things. Their whole foundation is based on being charitable and they've done so much for the communities and stuff like my, my father's I guess committed his whole life to that in some way. Um, but the older I've gotten, the more I've looked at several people around the world and thought, you're an inspiration, you're an inspiration, you're an inspiration. But hang on, I've never met you. I only know things about you that have inspired the world. Like, where, where, where am I actually conjuring that inspiration mm. from? Is it because it's a psychological thing? And I'm telling myself to be inspired because other people are inspired by your and or their endeavors. Um, and so I kind of landed on it recently, I'd probably say about three, six, three to six months ago, um, having consumed several bits of podcasts and materials online. And it kind of boiled down to like this physical and psychological manifestation of I have done so much for myself in my life. I've shown up for myself in the hardest of times and I've had to push myself to come out of the deepest, darkest places. I've had to educate myself in the corporate world to achieve wonderful things in my roles. And from a physical perspective, setting up the businesses that I have. And I just thought to myself, like, you know, actually, you know what? You've done so much for yourself. I just feel like my own inspiration. And I had a very, very powerful session yesterday with a psychotherapist that I'm working with. And we did a deep diving session into what I want for my business moving forward and how I visualize myself in the future with the people around me, with the business being successful and how I'm going to touch people's lives and give back to the world something that serves my purpose but serves their purpose too. And it kind of landed on, I am because I am. I exist to inspire. Yeah. And, and that was something that was very powerful, powerful for me. A lot more of these things are happening. I've become a lot more spiritual as a result of doing all this in a child work and deep diving and subconscious work and it's profound the effect it's had on like my creativity, the noise in my head, the ADHD, taking my creative ideas and thinking about how I will implement them into the business. Yeah. And um, yeah, it's been it's been an incredible journey so far. And so my inspiration has very much come from pain, I guess, um, and having to be there for myself when nobody else can be there. And really, I guess, showing up for yourself. Yeah. And that's a very powerful place to be in for your for you to be your own inspiration because that's something that can never get taken away from you. People who are sort of surface level, yeah, they inspire you, but that they're you're inspired by what they've shown you. You don't know what's going on inside of them. So would you truly want to be that person? You never know because you don't know what's happening in their head. You only know what you see. Yeah, so absolutely. You being your own inspiration can never be taken away from you. You'll always be there for you. You always have been through what's happened to you and, and now you always will be. So that's a very powerful position to be in. Yeah, yeah it's a, it sets the foundation for, if you're committed and you know what you want to do and you have a plan, it's right with you. Yeah. Um, so very exciting. Yeah. Well, this has been a lot of fun. Yeah. Thank you. I'm excited for, for the ADHD talk. It's, uh, Me too. I think we're going to have a lot of fun with that. It's, uh, it's a crazy subject. It's a lot. It's, uh, yeah. It's a lot to talk about. Yeah. And it'll be interesting because I know with my ADHD, I can go off into so many Yeah, so like <laughs> two people with ADHD talking about ADHD is going to be very interesting. <laughs> but um, in closing, I would like to ask you for some words of inspiration for the next person who's going to come onto the podcast. Okay. So, if you will write those okay. in at the bottom. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. 
Mm. I love adding bits to quotes. Um, <laughs> there have been so many quotes that I've that come across and and I've changed them to become my own, like things that I can you know, personalize. Yeah. Not to take away from the power of other people's literature. Yeah. When you make something your own, it becomes personal, special. Yeah. ADHD people are just weird. <laughs> <laughs> nothing has nothing is done. But like, you know how by many, the book. Um, it's done how it works for you. Yeah, you just ultra a bit. <laughs> but it's fascinating how many six really high highly successful people have got ADHD as well. Oh, yeah. And there's a lot of science to that. It's interesting. I've watched a very, very interesting thing about a guy who this guy's an interview for CIA. Mm -hmm. And it talks about the levels of trauma that are required whilst you're growing up to become an operative. You either have too much, which then results in people going with ADHD, the trauma resulting in obsessing with pornography, alcohol, drugs, yeah. and other things, mm -hmm. or the right amount, which makes you a fucking weapon. Yeah. Like, very successful. You can go from the extreme, the consuming too much alcohol, drugs, pornography, or whatever else, to doing a lot of work on yourself and coming back from that into yeah. it's a weapon, weapon mode. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. So, yeah, we're just, Yes. Thank you very much. I uh, love that. Me too. Thank you for having me. Yes, it does. <laughs> I'm excited for us to read this <laughs> next. <laughs>